السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا I praise Allah and thank Him and I ask Allah to send His praise, peace and blessings upon His beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his family, his companions, and those who follow them in excellence until the Day of Judgment. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to be able to study in Medina and to uh, submit my PhD thesis. Alhamdulillah, I was able to study in the College of Sharia and then do a master's in fiqh and a mas- uh, PhD in, in fiqh. And Allah blessed me <coughs> to be able to study with the uh, uh, ulama of Medina, the scholars of Medina, and people always, the students who come when uh, we get together, always ask me about how to seek knowledge and what are the keys to knowledge, and they hear so many different things and they see so many different classes, they see so many different books, they so, see so many things online, and there's so much going on whether in the city or on the internet or uh, hundreds and thousands of books and hundreds and thousands of lectures. So they get confused, where do I begin? How do I start? And how do I tread the path of scholarship and knowledge? So Alhamdulillah, we've had many discussions with the students regarding this. And this is what I always recommend to students. It is called at taqseel al-ilmi. at taqseel al-ilmi, how to have foundation, how to build a foundation in the sciences of Islam, how to build a foundation in the ulum al-shari'ya wal arabiya the sciences of Islam and Arabic. And inshallah in this uh, episode, I will try to break it down, and it might need several episodes to go more in depth, but I will try to give the most important points to explain to any student who wants to study the Sharia, who wants to study Islam, and who wants to know the path of scholarship, how it's done. Now, it is not an easy matter. It will take work. It will take a lot of hard work. It's not going to be by reading a few books or reading a few articles or listening to a few lectures. That is not the way at all to tread the path of scholarship and to gain ta'seel ilmi foundational knowledge. Rather, it will require a lot of work and dedication, learning Arabic, memorizing the Quran and a lot of the mutun that the scholars have written, and understanding them properly, and following a step-by-step method in the different Islamic fields. It takes many years, but it will bring its fruit, and this is the way that the scholars of the past have followed. And this is there is no other way that I know of that can bring about scholars. So let's begin with the issue of seeking knowledge. How is it? How do we begin? I'm not going to talk about the virtues of knowledge. I'm not going to talk about. Uh, the beauty of uh, gaining Islamic knowledge and so forth. I'm going to go straight into how to study. First and foremost, the most important thing after having ikhlas and a sincere intention to seek knowledge, a person must study the Arabic language if they do not know the Arabic language already. They'll have to go through a program which teaches them the Arabic language the classical Arabic language, as well as a bit of the modern Arabic language. And there are many programs and curriculums written, like Al-Arabiya Bayna Daik, the Medina program, and different other curriculums and programs. You will need a a good teacher, and you will need to follow this program until you reach a level of mastery or close to mastery, so where you're almost equivalent to an original Arabic speaker. This might take two years if you study hard. This might take three years. In terms of time and and your constraints and your abilities, that differs from person to person. But you have to go through a strong Arabic program and take it very seriously that you uh, learn the Arabic language and you strengthen all 
skills from vocabulary to grammar to listening to speaking to writing to reading all of these skills are very important and it will continue with you you will continue developing these skills as you learn Islamic sciences but you do not want to get into the serious studies of Islam until you have mastered or are close to mastering the Arabic language where you can listen to for example a lecture by a, an Arabic uh, a Muslim scholar and understand it a hundred percent or ninety plus percent this is where you want to get to you might have a difficulty with one or two or three words for example but you won't have an issue you want to get to the level where you can be reading any classic book in Islam whether it's in tafsir or hadith or aqidah or fiqh and at least understand the uh, modern commentaries or some of the classic con commentaries so you want to be able to reach that level where you can read correctly and uh, listen and understand and you're able to write and take notes and so forth you cannot underestimate this stage and this will determine how strong you'll be able to be in the Islamic in studying the Islamic sciences so Arabic is the key the, and your strength in Arabic is the key a lot of students don't take this time uh, the time when they study Arabic too seriously so they be they're weak in Arabic and they struggle as they continue their Islamic studies so take your time studying Arabic and mastering it and it will always uh, be to your advantage after that after studying Arabic you want to break the barrier of memorizing and if you're able to break that barrier of memorizing while you're studying Arabic that's even better so if you're studying Arabic full-time or close to full-time and you're able to start memorizing with a teacher uh, and reviewing what you memorize that would be amazing breaking the barrier of memorizing and not fearing uh, memorization of anything is very important a lot of people from the West are afraid to memorize they say I can't memorize only Arabs can memorize it's so hard I've tried to memorize the Quran or tried to memorize and it's difficult I can't retain it and so forth most most people are able to memorize whether it's Quran or any other texts is that it's just that they have to break the barrier follow a systematic method of memorization and review and continue be continuous and con, uh, consecutive and, and not stop and the first thing a person should memorize is the Quran as well as some of the adhkar of the morning and the evening of the different adhkar that are found in books like Hassan al-Muslim and other books and al-arba'in al al-nawiyya the 40 ahadith or 42 ahadith of Imam al-Nawi along with the editions of Ibn Rajab these are foundational ahadith that a person must know and these adhkar a person must know and a student of knowledge should never uh, doubt that he must and should memorize the entire Quran and it can take two to four years depending on how fast you memorize the point is not how fast you memorize the point is memorizing systematically with mastery even if you memorize half a page or a third of a page in the beginning and increase slowly but your review is always strong and you're reviewing daily with a teacher or with a student in a class or a halaqa until you finish and until you keep up that memorization while you're memorizing the Quran or while you're memorizing the adhkar or while you're memorizing Arba'in Nawiyya you want to use that opportunity as well to increase your Arabic vocabulary so when you memorize half a page of Quran you will try to take those words in the Quran and understand their meanings in English at least so for example Alhamdu Lillahi Rabbil Alameen you'll know what Al means what what is Alhamdu Alhamd Alam Li and Lillah Allah Rabb Al Alameen and so forth word for word translation of everything you are memorizing and then the general meaning so word for word of Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and the general meaning all praises due to Allah for example 
when you do this throughout the entire Quran, you will build a lot of vocabulary, which will help you later on as you're learning Arabic and as you study the Islamic sciences. Likewise, when you study the 40 hadith of an nawawi or uh, the Athkar in Hasr al-Muslim or any book of Athkar, you will memorize each dhikr that you do or each hadith that you do, that you memorize, you will understand every word that you're memorizing and the general meaning of the uh, hadith or the dhikr. So breaking the barrier of memorizing and realizing that as a student of knowledge, you will have a time in your day where you will be memorizing something and reviewing until for the rest of your life. It doesn't end because you have the Quran and then you have the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Then you have these short mutun, beginner texts called mutun in the various Islamic fields. And then you have advanced mutun, which are longer Islamic texts in the various Islamic fields. And then you have Arabic poetry, uh, which is also important and strengthens your Arabic and your understanding of the Quran and Sunnah. But in a systematic way and prior to prioritizing what's most important, a student of knowledge will begin with the Qur'an and begin with memorizing along with it the adhkar of Hassan al-Muslim and the 40 hadith of an nawawi While they're learning Arabic or after they learn Arabic, preferably if they can do both at the same time and use the memorization of the Qur'an, the memorization of the adhkar and Arba'in nawawiyya as a way to strengthen their Arabic, that would be ideal if they are able to. If they are unable to and they need to study Arabic first and then begin a memorization program of the Quran and the Arba'in and Nawi and the 40 Hadith, that's fine as well. After a person finishes that stage, and it might overlap with a person's studies, but preferably a person can get that out of the way so that they can after that review and focus on gaining ta'seel, uh, foundational knowledge so here a person now learned arabic and they memorized the quran and know word for word meaning of the words of the quran and arba'in nawi and the adhkar now they are going to get into the islamic sciences the islamic sciences are of two types maqasid and al ulum ala maqasid are goals in and of themselves so Learning the Qur'an and its meaning is a goal. Learning the ahadith and their meanings is a goal in itself. Learning the rules of fiqh is a goal. Learning the rules of uh, or the aqidah is a goal. Inheritance is part of fiqh. It's a goal. The adab, the etiquettes and manners of a Muslim and so forth uh, is a goal. As for the ulum al-ala, which are tools that help you understand and help you understand the uh, language of the ulama and give you the tools to be able to uh, yeah, and arrive at a conclusion and be able to derive a rule or to know the stronger opinion, these are called ulum al-ala. And in Arabic, we have, for example, al nahu Arabic grammar, and the Arab, al-sarf, which is morphology, and how the word changes into different formats. One word, like Hamida, can have so many different words, uh, <coughs> the past tense, the present tense, the future tense, uh, the subject, the object, and so forth. All of this is studied in sarf. So you have Hamida and then Hamid and Mahmoud, Hamida Yahmad Hamdan and Hamid and Mahmoud and Muhammad Muhammad and so forth. You have all of these different forms of a word, whether it's Fa'al Mali, Mudari, Amr, Masdar, Ism Fa'il, Ism Maf'ul, Ism Zaman, Ism Makan, and so forth, which help you uh, expand your uh, understanding of the Arabic language and that one word becomes 50 words all of a sudden through sarf. You have balagha, Arabic eloquence, studying the sciences of eloquence in the uh, Arabic language. A very important uh, 
uh, subject that is studied. Arabic vocabulary. There are books for building your vocabulary, giving you synonyms, giving you uh, the most important words to memorize and so forth. There's a whole program for that. Imla, how to write properly in Arabic, because sometimes it's difficult with the rules of Hamza and the rules of Alif and so forth. A student needs to understand the rules of, of writing in Arabic correctly. And we see uh, mistakes from even adults in writing Arabic because they don't know the basic rules of Imla or how to write properly in Arabic. They might be able to write, but when it comes to the Hamza at the end or in the beginning, they won't know where to put it or in the middle. Uh, we have also the poetry, which helps Arabic poetry, which helps uh, the student understand the Quran and the Sunnah. The companions and those after them used to memorize a lot of poetry. Aisha radiallahu anha used to memorize thousands of lines of poetry because this would aid them. This was their culture and this would aid them in understanding the Quran and Sunnah because they came in the highest forms of eloquence of the Arabic language. So these are some of the signs in the Arabic language which aid a person in uh, studying Islamic sciences. The stronger you are in Nahu and Sarf and Balagha and Arabic vocabulary and so forth, you'll, you'll have less of a hard time understanding the ulama, especially when they speak about these issues or when the ayah or the hadith or the ruling has to do with uh, the meaning of a certain harf, ila, an, the ba, for example, or a nahr rule, or a sarf rule, or a balagha rule. These come up a lot in tafsir. They come up a lot in the commentaries of hadith. They come up a lot in commentaries in aqidah and fiqh. A lot of the Arabic language and the uh, a lot of the Islamic sciences, a lot of the different opinions go back to the Arabic language, whether it's nahr, sarf, uh, balagha, vocabulary, and, and so forth. So these are all tools that help a person learn uh, and understand and be able to strengthen themselves as they tread the path of scholarship. The knowledge of usul al-fiqh is very important because it helps a person derive a ruling correctly. Anytime you hear a dalil in the Quran and Sunnah, to derive a ruling correctly, you have to use a principle from the principles of usul al-fiqh whether you realize that or not and whether the scholar who says so is mentioning that rule or he's not mentioning it and it's well known to them every single ayah every single hadith if you want to derive a rule correctly from it you need a principle from usul al-fiqh these are the principles that allow you to correctly derive rules from the texts uh, a lot of these rules go back to the Arabic language. A lot of them go back to Islamic principles that are set. And it is a very important science. The stronger you are in usul al-fiqh, the stronger you will be in learning the evidences and how a rule is derived from those evidences, knowing if there's a difference of opinion, what's the stronger opinion and why it's the stronger opinion. I cannot underestimate the importance of usul al-fiqh. A person should not be able to speak regarding uh, the Sharia and Islamic rulings and derive opinion or give a stronger opinion or uh, any of that unless they have mastered the science of usul al-fiqh in theory and in application. And the stronger a person is in usul al-fiqh, the stronger they will be in fiqh, otherwise they will be stuck in taqlid, in the realm of taqlid, following a scholar that they trust and following their proof that they use as proof. Uh, they will never be able to properly under, uh, know which opinion within a madhab or outside of a madhab are, is stronger because they don't have the tools. It's, it's very simple and this is something that is well known amongst all scholars. And there's no doubt about this uh, amongst the, uh, the scholars of Islam. Another important ilm or science in Islam is the science of hadith. The science of hadith which helps a person understand the 
language of the scholars of hadith when they consider hadith authentic sahih or hasan or da'if or mawdur authentic hasan or weak or fabricated and so forth they have a, a very intricate and meticulous language and meticulous rules to be able to distinguish between authentic and inauthentic a hadith the science of hadith deals with this and if a person has a decent understanding of it they will understand the scholars of hadith and if they go into a higher level study of hadith they themselves will be able to give rulings on the hadith and and choose the stronger first choose the stronger opinions amongst the scholars of hadith and read their research whether it's uh, earlier scholars like the darqutni imam ahmed al-bukhari or uh, yani scholars like ibn hajar and al-dhahabi and ibn kathir or later scholars such as uh, sheikh ahmed shakir or sheikh al-albani or other scholars of hadith may allah have mercy on them so if a person has the science of hadith well understood they can understand first the what the scholars of hadith are saying second if there are, is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars and they've reached that level they'll be able to choose the stronger opinion regarding the hadith's authenticity and third if they reach even a higher level they'll be able to produce their own rulings on a hadith even though they cannot they must uh, benefit from the scholars of the past and what they have said regarding the hadith but they will be able to reach that level of scholarship of hadith if they study enough and they study properly the science of hadith and they practice it enough now these are the sciences uh, the main sciences of islam there are of course there's inheritance law that is written by itself and there is uh, when it comes to fiqh the mutun of the madhahib uh, of fiqh they start with beginner mutun they bring they just mentioned the rules according to one of the four madhahib and then they have intermediate books for an intermediate student and advanced books that only mention rules and then there are books that mention the proofs for these rules and then there are books that mention the difference of opinions within the uh within one madhab and there are book and their proofs and there are books that mention the difference of opinion amongst the all the madhahib and mention their proofs and the the proofs of the other madhahib and there's a whole debate an academic debate that goes on in these books of of higher khilaf where they mention the difference of opinion amongst the ulama so for example in the hanbali madhab you have a beginner book uh, like umda al-fiqh or akhsar al-muhtasarat you have an intermediate book like dalil al-talib or zad al-mustaqni' or umda al-talib and you have an advanced book like uh الروض المربع منتهى الإرادات and even more advanced like الإقناع which mention pretty much rules and then you have books that mention the أدلة like الكافي by Ibn Qudama and the difference of opinion amongst the madhab like المقنع and, and the أدلة of the madhab like الكافي and you have the higher uh, the, just the difference of opinion within the madhab like الإنصاف and then you have books that mention the higher khilaf amongst the four madhab and the uh, other scholars outside of the form of the Ahib, like Al-Mughni by Ibn Qudama. So the smallest book is about one volume and has 1500 uh, masail or issues of fiqh that are discussed. And the biggest book by Ibn Qudama, rahimahullah, is a 14 volume uh, masterpiece and an encyclopedia of fiqh. And you can say the same in all of the other form of the Ahib and the other books of fiqh as well that are outside of the form of the Ahib. Then you have with the madhahib, along with the madhahib, you have uh, usul al, the usul of, of that madhahib, usul al-fiqh. You have qawaid fiqhiya book, books, fiqh maxims that deal with that madhahib's uh, principles of fiqh or maxims of fiqh, which are also very important after studying a madhahib to study those fiqh principles or fiqh maxims or qawaid al-fiqhiya. Uh, you have the ulum al-Qur'an tajweed and the qira'at and usul al-tafsir all of these are different sciences uh, you have mantiq logic which comes a lot in aqidah and in usul al-fiqh uh, you have adab al-bahth wal munadhara the etiquettes of debate and uh, research in Islam and in the Islamic sciences a very important uh, science you have seerat al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from small short 
poems are memorized and then intermediate text and higher text and more advanced text. So you always have in all of these fields a beginner book, an intermediate book, an advanced book. Now what a student wants to do is start taking one metan at a time and memorizing it and understanding it with a teacher. And a person might say that's so much and that's so difficult. Uh, and we forgot to mention Aqidah, of course it has its own books and mutun that are basic, intermediate, advanced, and then uh, encyclopedic books and refutations. Uh, a person wants to start studying the small mutun, going through a small metan that they memorize, which is a small text, in the different sciences. So they'll, for example, start off with Nahu, with a book like Ajrumiya or the poem of Ajrumiya, and then uh, in Sarf they can start with Bina al Afal, in Balagha they can start with Mi'at al Ma'ani or Al Jawhar al Maknoon, or in Usul al Fiqh, Nadm al Waraqat, or Al Waraqat, and in Usul al Tafsir Muqaddima, Fi Usul al Tafsir by Shaykh al Sabin Taymiyyah, or the Muqaddimah of Ibn Juzay's Ulum al-Tasheel, which is his tafsir, the Muqaddimah is in Ulum al-Quran, a very beneficial book in Ulum al-Quran. Uh, in Aqidah, they can start with the shorter mutun in, in Aqidah that they'll memorize and study. Uh, for example, Asul al-Thalatha or Kitab al-Tawheed, and then Aqidah al-Wasitiyya, and Lum'at al-I'tiqad, and then al-Tahawiyya, these are all books that are to be studied in a certain order. In fiqh, you have a short metan like Umd al-Fiqh or Akhsar al-Mukhtasarat that you would just study and understand, memorize and understand that book without going deep. So when you do that with all the different sciences we mentioned, that level one, and you memorize it and you go through a basic, simple sharh, with a teacher without going in depth, very important not to go in depth in the beginning, and go make a full round with all the Arabic and Islamic sciences that I mentioned, memorizing for in each metan, in each science, one metan, and making that your foundation, then you have gained a strong, solid foundation in that ilm. And a lot of those ulum will need practice, like Nahu and Usul al-Fiqh and Sarf and so forth. They will need practice, not just learning the rules, but applying them uh, through I'rab or through Sarf or practices and through uh, Usul al-Fiqh practice and so forth. So preferably, when you go through this stage, you will also try to do as many exercises with your teacher as you can. Once you finish a full round of all these sciences, then you go to a level two, where you will read an intermediate book in all of these sciences, taking it one by one or, or two at a time, whatever you're able to, but with mastery and uh, focus. Then if you finish the level two program, you would go to an advanced level and you, would, and you would memorize at the advanced level. So you want to memorize something as, for a beginner that's short, and something, after, if you fit, do that for all the beginner classes, then study the intermediate level without memorizing. Then study the advanced level and start memorizing those mutun. And you'll have to pr prioritize what's mo most important for you to memorize. Because having ta'seel is based on two main pillars, memorizing and understanding. Memorizing a metin and understanding that metin. Once you do that for any science, then you have a strong foundation in that science. So for example, in Nahu, the, all the rules of Nahu revolve around the following books. As a beginner, the rules of Nahu would be in Al-Ajrumiya, then Mutammimat Al-Ajrumiya, then Qatr Al-Nada, in terms of the rules. And in terms of Arab and all the special rules of Arab, you'd find them in Nuqtat Al-Arab by Ibn Hisham, Qawaid al-Arab by Ibn Hisham. And then the advanced level for Nahu would be Al-Fiyat ibn Malik, a simple sharh, then an advanced sharh. And then uh, in terms of I'rab, Mughni al-Labib by Ibn Hisham. So this is just looking at Nahu, for example. 
they're the same goes for all the different fields they have a step-by-step -step program whether it's three books or five books or six books that will give you the most important details and and in a step-by-step -step manner where you're getting a little bit the most important things at the beginner level then more things at the intermediate level then more things at the advanced level and then after that if you want to specialize and become a master of that science you can now read freely in any of its books so if you reach that level of al-fiyat ibn malik and nahu you are you have all the foundations needed to read on in nahu likewise if you reach that level of mughni al-labib if you reach that level, if you go in fiqh, for example, through Aqsar al-Muhtasarat, Umd al-Fiqh, Zahad al-Mustaqni, Arraud al-Murbi', then you are free now to read the books of the Hanabila, the more advanced books like Al-Kafi and Al-Mughni and Al-Insaf and Al-Furur. And you can become a master in that field. But before that, those le that level one, level two, and level three will give you foundations. Now, if you want to know where you are as a student of knowledge, ask yourself where you have reached in all of those sciences. So if you did not study Ajrumiya in Nahu, then you're or something at that level, then you're at a level zero in Nahu. If you study Ajrumiya, you're at a beginner level. If you studied Mutammat Ajrumiya and Qatr al Nadir, you're at an intermediate level. If you studied Al Fiyat ibn Malik, you're at an advanced level in Nahu. Now for example, say, and I, when I say, yani, you studied, you've memorized, and you've mastered, and you've understood what's to be given at that level. You say the same thing for sarf and balagha and usul al fiqh and musal hadith and fiqh and hadith and tafsir and so forth. All of these sciences have a step by step book. Alhamdulillah, there's a great website that has gathered all of this information and gathered all the mutun that a student of knowledge is recommended to study in all of the fields, what's to be studied at a beginner level, what's to be studied at an intermediate level, and what's to be studied at an advanced level. It's called Takween al rasikhin T-A-K-W dot I-N. Now it gives you all the audio shuroor and the written shuroor or commentaries of these mutun as well as the actual texts but it will give you a guideline and a map as to what needs to be done to reach that level of Islamic scholarship. Now the issue is a lot of students who go to the Jamia or to go to study in an Islamic university, they learn Arabic in two years quickly and then they're thrown in the deep end in one of the colleges of either Sharia or Hadith or Quran or Arabic or Da'wah and Usul al-Din and they're reading advanced books in all of in, in their specialty. So they're reading advanced books in Sharia and Fiqh and Usul al Fiqh. In Arabic, they're reading advanced books in Balagha and Nahu and so forth. And in Hadith, they're reading advanced books in Mustalah al Hadith and so forth. And in Aqidah as well, as, uh, as well as uh, Ulum al Quran. They're jumping into the deep end and they will realize that they are not memorizing. And they're not having strong foundations in the different Islamic sciences. What that produces, it gives a person keys, it gives a person exposure, it gives a person an idea of what's out there, but it does not give them mastery. It does not give them mastery. So, inshallah, I hope this has helped uh, give an understanding of what Tawseel requires. And it's a long road, but if a person utilizes his time wisely, and doesn't waste time on reading books that do not uh, benefit him in ta'seel. So they might read a lot of random books that waste their time in ta'seel. Or they might listen to a lot of audio tapes that waste their time in ta'seel. Or they might attend durus or watch things on the internet that do not help them in their ta'seel. That is the main problem because they have the time but they're not utilizing it properly. They're reading the wrong books. They're not wrong books, but they're not helping them in building their foundation in, uh, yeah, in, the, in Sharia or in the Islamic sciences. So if a person utilizes his time properly, has a memorization class that he goes to daily, and always is reading a short commentary of a, of a metan, for example, and checking off as soon as he finishes that metan, it will not take too long. It can take only up to a year or a year and a half to be, to, or two years to finish all the beginner mutun. And it can take three years 
to finish the intermediate mutun and it can take five years to finish the advanced mutun and that's five plus three plus two which is ten in ten years you can have somebody who is ready to become uh, a scholar in any of the fields that he has reached an advanced level in and he'll be a very very strong student of knowledge who understands when he reads who can uh, choose a stronger opinion who can uh, derive correct opinion if he follows a system properly if he has teachers and access to teachers who can help him in the beginning and in his intermediate level and his advanced level so it is important that he has a memorization program a short commentary that he reads to an, a specialized teacher and he goes to those teachers when he has problems or when he does not understand something and those teachers should be helping him and guiding him so you have to tailor your own program to be able to fulfill these goals that I just mentioned or to fulfill these means that will uh, give you the what is needed to become a scholar ta'ala. now a person might say that's too difficult or it's going to take a long time or I won't be able to and so forth that's fine even if you do not reach that level you know where you stand and you know what you know and you know what you do not know each science you know your level is it a, a beginner intermediate or advanced or a specialist and you always can if you have strong understanding of the Arabic language you can summarize to your community and to whoever you're teaching you can summarize the works of the scholars alhamdulillah a, a lot of the scholars especially the contemporary contemporary scholars have uh, broke down and made the Islamic sciences easy especially Mashayikh like Sheikh Ibn Uthameen rahimahullah ta'ala he had the ability to make everything that he teaches very easy to understand so if and there's other scholars as well who did that so if you never reached a high level in any of the sciences and you need to teach that you need to teach for example aqidah or fiqh or tafsir or hadith uh, all you have to do is take a book that explains this well by, written by a scholar and summarize that book for the students but when it comes to questions and answers and they start asking questions that you do not know that you have not mastered that you have not studied say I will get back to you and ask a specialist in the field and do not give fatwa and do not give your own opinion and do not try to pretend to be a scholar when you haven't reached that level and this is uh, an issue of honesty with yourself and honesty with the Muslim community that you know your level there's not a single problem with you reading to them a book or summarizing a book written by scholars and giving them what those scholars say and if they ask questions that you have not come across and that you do not have a direct answer to that you refer them to the scholars and that you get them back to the scholars inshallah we'll end with this and hopefully in the future we'll be able to record lectures on how to memorize the Quran how to memorize the mutun how to study fiqh in depth uh, according to one of the uh, four madhahib and a discussion on studying fiqh through a madhab versus any other method as well as anything else that will help the students of knowledge in their track of seeking knowledge uh, Allah ta'ala alam wa subhanakallahum bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa sallallahu sallam ala nabina muhammad wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh